Welcome to the online service of Christ Community Brookside Campus. We're thankful that you're joining us this morning, and if you're newer with us or just started worshiping online, we would love to get to know you and encourage you to fill out our online connect card. We want to know um, you to know how much we miss seeing you in person, and if indoor activities don't work for you at this time, we do want to just share with you some upcoming outdoor opportunities to connect with your church family. First, on October 8th, we'll have a worship night in the park, so meet at Tower Park in Waldo at 6.30 p.m. Bring your own chair, and we'll spread out, and the band will lead us in an hour of praise and worship. Then, on Saturday morning, October 10th, from 9 to 10 a.m., we'll be in the alley that runs along the back of the church for a serve event. This is an event that's great for all ages. We'll be packing bags of food and other resources to give to the homeless that we encounter at intersections around the city. So this event um, does require registration online. Finally, even if you watch the service at home, we'd love for you to come over to the church at 11 o'clock on October 11th to enjoy lunch on the lawn with the rest of your church family. We've invited the Smoke and Soul food truck, which will be selling a Korean Kansas City barbecue fusion, which is awesome, I'm telling you, it's so good. This is a great way to connect with your church family in an outdoor distance manner as well. And we wanted to say finally that even if we haven't seen you in quite some time, we still love you and we care about you and we miss you. So please let your staff know how we can pre be praying for you with our prayer card link or just email one of us anytime. Now let's prepare to open our hearts to what God has to teach us in the book of Revelations and um, through worshiping him in song. Yeah. 
my ears I want to hear you speak Tell me your thoughts What's on your mind I'll be your friend I want to see through your eyes I want to see through your eyes I want to see through
Good morning, I'm Emmeline Case, and our reading today comes from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through chapter 5, verse 2. And after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had an appearance of a Jasper and a Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pills of thunder. And before the throne was burning seven torches of fire, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it is, like a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before him, saying, Worthy are you, Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Then I saw in the right hand of him who seats on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw the mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? The word of the Lord. Welcome to Christ Community's online service again. We're so glad that you are with us and watching today. And we're continuing in our series in Revelation. So as we begin this message uh, here, let me just pray and ask for God's help as we look at this passage, this beautiful passage of Scripture together. So Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us to see you more clearly in all of your majesty. And the Lamb who is slain, who is sitting on the throne, and the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit, empowering us to understand and worship you right now. Would we be caught up in that right now as we look at this passage? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first, I was speechless. And then all I could whisper was, wow. As I slowly began to catch my breath in the thin air, I had just finished scrambling up the edge of a small waterfall that's the only way to access Sky Pond and Rocky Mountain National Park. It's perched at almost 11,000 feet, 10,900 feet into the Rocky Mountains. But it wasn't primarily the high altitude that took my breath away that morning as I climbed above that waterfall and looked out over the valley. The view was stunning. I had begun the hike in darkness, and on my way up, I paused at this pond here, which is called Sky Pond, or, or excuse me, called The Lock. So I stopped at The Lock, watching the sun rise. But not even the beauty of the sunrise over The Lock could prepare me for what I would see when I finally reached Sky Pond above it. This was the view that greeted me as I climbed over the edge of the waterfall and turned around to see where I had hiked from. Now, of course, the, the view that you're seeing from my iPhone, iPhone falls, short, falls short of the actual experience of being there, right? And yet it gives a glimpse of what I experienced, and that moved me to what can only be described in that moment of taking in that valley as worship. Now, depending on your experiences, your religious or non-religious background, the language of worship may stir up a wide variety of feelings and images and ideas in your imagination. Uh, maybe you think when you hear the language of worship of people bowing down to statues. Or maybe if you're of a certain generation of Saturday Night Live viewers, you think of Wayne and Garth, right? We are not worthy. Maybe you think of a Buddhist monk or Islamic prayers. Uh, for many of us, we, when we hear the language of worship, might think of a church service in a, a particular even portion of a church service where we're singing songs or where we at least used to sing songs. Uh, others might think of the view in nature, something like the picture 
that I showed there from Sky Pond. But whatever comes in your mind when you think about worship, the late writer David Foster Wallace, who was not a Christian, argues in his famous Kenyon College commencement address that worship is at the heart of everyone's life. Listen to what he writes, what he spoke that day at that address. He says this, In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, again, he's addressing college students, there is no actual thing such as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships, he says. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing something of some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or a Wiccan mother goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some infragible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap your real meaning in life, you will never have enough. Never feel like you are enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power and you will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. So that's powerful, right? I mean, what incredible insight that we get from Wallace there. But then he makes this even more critical observation. He says this, look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is that they are unconscious. They are our default setting. You see, we all worship. We all do. It's our default setting. And here in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, what we just heard read for us, John unveils, and and that's what this idea of revelation is all about, is about unveiling. John unveils the most real reality of worship. And the only worship, in fact, that won't ultimately eat you alive if you give yourself fully to it. And so as we look at this section this morning of Revelation 4 and 5, we are going to see three observations about how worship works in our lives and with it the power um, of, of, of other things as well. So what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm making here is that worship that we're going to see here, this observation applies to worship of Jesus, but it also applies to worship of money or power or anything else. This is just observations about how worship works. And we're going to see, one, that worship is inspired by wonder. Second, that it is fueled by rescue. And third, that it's evidenced in loyalty. That's how worship works, that it's inspired by wonder. You start by wondering, by standing in awe. It's fueled by the sense of being rescued by what we worship, and it's ultimately evidenced in our allegiance and our loyalty. So first we see here in chapter 4 this incredible picture, and we see that worship is inspired by wonder. We only worship which captures our imaginations with wonder. And John, the writer of Revelation, has certainly has this awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping, wonder-inducing experience when he steps through the door that stands open to heaven Verse 1 of chapter 4. Take a look again at verses 1 through 3. But before you do, and as you look there, keep in mind two things. First, John is writing in a very specific type of literary genre called apocalypse. Now, oftentimes we think apocalypse means the end of the world. That's not actually what the, the word means in biblical genres of literature. It's not about the end of the world per se, but about a revealing and uncovering real reality. That's what the Greek word apocalypsis means. It means to uncover. It's about pulling back the curtain on what is really true. And so a perfect picture of what apocalypse is, what revelation is in this sense of this literary genre, is the moment in the film The Wizard of Oz when Toto the dog pulls back the curtain to reveal that it's only a little man working the controls of the supposed great and terrible Wizard of Oz. That is exactly what apocalypse is. It's an uncovering, an unveiling of the truth of the reality in the world. Toto apocalypsed the wizard, unveiled what is really true. That's what this genre, this genre of revelation is all about. And second, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Second, as we look at these verses and I read them again, this genre has specific rules and conventions, and one of them is the use of vivid images, 
uh, lots of metaphors and symbols to engage our imaginations because we're trying to get us to see differently, to see the world differently. Okay, so with those things in mind, those two things in mind, let's read verses 1 through 3 again, where John says this, After I this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. We're, we're entering into this apocalyptic vision. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. That's a pretty stunning picture. And one, again, if you're not used to reading apocalyptic literature from 2,000 years ago, maybe seems pretty bizarre to us. But, but just wait. The deeper we go into this book of Revelation, we're just getting started here. It's going to get a lot more bizarre than that. But just because it seems bizarre to us and implausible to us as 21st century readers who have little or no experience reading this sort of literature does not mean that we should dismiss it. Again, just because it seems unusual to us doesn't mean that it's invalid or wrong or untrue. I mean, it'd be like the Apostle John who wrote this book uh, getting a copy of the Twilight series from us and being like, hey, John, what did you think of, of the Twilight series? What did you think? Right? He wouldn't even have a category for that type of literature. This is an important principle to remember when we're reading our Bibles, and that is that our Bibles are certainly written for us, But they are not written to us in the sense that as us as their original and primary audience. They were written to audiences in a different language, in a different culture, 2,000 years ago. So our Bibles are written for us, but they're not written directly to us. And so we should expect that there should be some things that are confusing or difficult, or we need background in those cultures, in those languages, to be able to understand. But whether it is an apocalyptic vision or the view from Sky Pond... We only worship what captures our imaginations with wonder. We only worship what captures our imaginations with wonder. And what captures John here is the spectacular view into the throne room of heaven. And the language of throne occurs over and over and over again in these two chapters and throughout the book of Revelation. And the language of throne is used more in the book of of Revelation than any other place in the New Testament. And one of the primary things that Revelation reveals, one of the primary things that it uncovers, that it shows, is the triune God is on the throne ruling all reality. It's almost the exact opposite moment of the Wizard of Oz, where what's uncovered is that there's a a puny little person behind the great and terrible wizard. Here, the vision is opposite, where it seems like there are lots of rulers, puny rulers, ruling and controlling, that actually there's one who is seated on the throne, who is and was and is to come, and he is sovereign over all things. Despite what it may look like at any given moment or circumstances, John is showing us that God is the one who is ultimately in control. He is on the throne. And he wants our imagination and our wonder to be captured and enthralled by that reality because, again, you will only worship what you wonder at. You will only worship what you wonder at. So worship is inspired by wonder, but it is fueled and sustained by rescue. Worship is fueled by rescue. And what do I mean by that? Whatever we worship, whether it's money or sex or power or food, we worship it because we believe that this will make me okay, that this will make me happy, that this will make the sad things come untrue. And every one of us knows our stories and our world is full of sad things, and we are all longing for, looking for something to make those sad things come untrue. And yet there comes a moment when those things will let us down. And when we do, we have the same reaction as John does here in chapter 5. He's seen this incredible vision of God on the throne in Revelation chapter 4. And it is perhaps one of the most arresting theophanies. That's what Bible nerds call visions or appearance of God, theophanies. And and I love the phrase that one scholar used to describe Revelation chapter 4. He called it the symphony of all of the Old Testament theophanies. 
All of these visions of God coming together, these appearances of God from, from Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all throughout the Bible, all captured here and brought, brought together in the crescendo of theophanies in Revelation chapter 4. There's unceasing worship. All is right. And then we read this. Chapter 5, verse 1. John says, And then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on back, sealed with seven seals. This number seven is so important in Revelation. We're going to see it over and over again. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And John says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. You see, John has the sense that at last everything sad is going to come untrue. It's all going to be okay. The scroll which contains the plan, the hope that evil will finally be judged, the world will be rescued, is there finally. The plan is going to unfold. All we have to do is open it up and and God's going to carry it forward. But then, oh no, there's no one who can open the plan. No one who can carry it out. And John falls apart. He is overwhelmed with weeping and sobbing. And you will have that moment in your life if you haven't already. You will have the moment in your life where the thing that you are worshiping will let you down, where the thing that you are looking at and say, if only I can have that thing, then I will be okay. Then I will be okay. Then the world will come unsad. But there will be a moment when that thing you've put your hope in to make the sad come untrue won't be enough. When your marriage ends, your body gets sick, your addiction is discovered, when you still aren't pregnant, when you're still single, when you lose your job, when your child rejects you, your boyfriend breaks up with you, you don't get into the college you long for, your happy-go-lucky personality is smothered in a cloud of darkness and depression, and you can't even get out of bed, and you find yourself like John weeping. Because the thing that you thought was going to make everything sad come untrue seems as though it is powerless to do anything anymore. When the thing you've looked to to rescue has failed you and it looks like everything will stay sad forever. But, but Revelation chapter 5 does not end in verse 4. So let's keep reading. John is on the ground. He's weeping. He's completely falling apart. And then Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, And behold, one of the latter elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the throne. And it's seven seals. Hope is not lost. The promised king, the great descendant of David, the conquering lion is here. He can rescue. He can open the scroll. He can carry out the plan. That's what John hears. That's what he expects. And what he expects is a fierce lion. But but this is what he sees. Not a fierce lion, but a slain lamb. Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, there's that seven again, and seven eyes and the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. You see, the slain lamb is the conquering lion. Jesus, the lamb who was crucified, can do it. He can rescue. He can open the scroll. He can bring it to pass. And Jesus, the king, who was dead for three days in the tomb, when everyone wept but rose again to wipe away the tear of every eye, he has conquered and he can rescue. But he doesn't do it with raw power. He can make everything sad untrue, but he is the conquering lion because he was first the suffering lamb. 
Uh, Listen to what Paul Spilberry writes in his fantastic little book called The Throne, the Lamb, and the Dragon. And if you only read one other book or resource about Revelation, and I would encourage you to do that with at least one thing. If you only do one book or one other resource to help you understand Revelation, I, I would highly recommend Paul Spilberry's book. And he says this, The slaughtered lamb is God's way of showing contempt for the power of the world. When God determines to establish his kingdom, he doesn't do it as the Romans did with invading armies and intimidation. Rather, he does it through the humiliating death of Jesus. Which means if you look to Jesus to rescue you, he won't eat you alive. Like everything else we try to get rescue from. And he's overcome death. So he'll always be there. And remember, whatever we worship, money, sex, power, food, we worship because we think it will make everything okay. We think it will make the sad things come untrue. But as David Foster Wallace points out, the most of the things we worship end up eating off of life. Only the lamb who is slain can rescue you from worshiping what will destroy you. Rather than destroy us, Jesus receives the consequences, wrath, and disorder that we deserve because of our rebellion and worshiping the created things rather than him, the creator. But he let evil and sin destroy him so that he can rescue you. And when you see that, the innocent lamb who is willingly slain for your sin, how can you not but join the elders and the living creatures and the angels and sing, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus, the slain lamb, gave his life to you, is the only one who you can give yourself wholly to, and he will not eat you alive, who won't destroy you. He was destroyed so that you could live, and now, both now, starting now, you can have that life now and forevermore. You are giving your worship to something or someone right now, something that deep down you think will rescue, you think will make the sad things come untrue, that will think that you make you okay, that will get you through the day, will get you through your year, your life. You are worshiping something, but is that thing setting you free? Or is it enslaving you? Does it make you kinder and more focused on others? Or is it turning you in on yourself? Is it prompting you to love those who oppose you and who are different from you? We worship what rescues us. Whatever we believe will make the sad thing come untrue. We give ourselves to holy. We give our loyalty to and our allegiance. And that's what we see next. Worship is ultimately expressed in allegiance. Our worship is evidenced in loyalty. That is our third observation. Worship begins in awe, but it quickly fades. If who or ever, whatever awes us, cannot make the sad things come untrue. But once we sense that something is beautiful and we believe that the sad thing can come untrue, we will give our allegiance and our loyalty to it. You see, the ultimate expression of worship is allegiance, our loyalty. Just think about it like this. You cannot worship the chiefs if you also root for the patriots half the time. Worship is evidenced in loyalty and allegiance. That's that's why political parties and movements and personalities so easily become idols because they present a compelling vision of what could be. They promise rescue. They promise to make the sad things come untrue and they demand allegiance. And this is true of the left and the right. It's true of the Republicans and the Democrats, the Greens and the Libertarians. Political life offers a vision that hopes to capture our imagination, that promises to make the sad thing come true. And and there's a place for that. But it is subordinate to our belonging and allegiance to the Lamb. Because we follow the slain Lamb first and foremost. We bear witness to a different sort of power in a different kingdom. We were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from every tongue and tribe and nation and people and language. Not so that we could give our ultimate allegiance to, to Russia or Romania, to Chad or China, the United States or the United Arab Emirates. We were redeemed for God, our loyalty and allegiance to Him. Listen to verses 5 through 10. We begin in verse 8, actually, here. And he says, it's, And when he, the Lamb, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed a people. What? For God. 
We belong to him. We are for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest, our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Jesus was slain. Jesus gave his blood. Why? For what purpose? To ransom a people for God. We belong to him. Spilsbury puts it this way. In worship, we rightly acknowledge the awesomeness of God and our total dependence on him. But worship is expressed in more than just songs or prayers. It is expressed in loyalty. To worship God means to follow the Lamb. It means to give allegiance to him in the great battle with the dragon. We are all in danger of worshiping, of giving our allegiance to something that is Jesus plus. Jesus plus. Jesus plus financial security. Jesus plus good food and drinks. Jesus plus the option to date or sleep with whoever I want, whenever I want. Jesus plus success in my work. Jesus plus equals nothing. That equation, Jesus plus anything equals nothing, but Jesus plus nothing else equals everything. And when you give your allegiance fully to him, you find security in something greater than money could ever buy. You find a satisfaction and comfort deeper than any meal or cocktail could ever be, it, give you. You find an intimacy in being known and closer and more enduring relationships could ever offer. And you enjoy an affirmation of your worth and value that no boss or career or achievement could ever give you. That's who you worship. So what's next? How do we respond to this, this centering vision of the Lamb on the throne in the very throne room of God? Well, there is only one response we can give. And that is to join the Amen. To say Amen is to agree with what has been proclaimed, to confirm its truthfulness and its goodness. When, when you say Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL, and I say Amen, I am agreeing, I'm affirming and joining with you in the truth of that statement. And that's the crescendo to which this symphony of theophany builds in verses 13 and 14 in chapter 5. And John says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Oh, Christ community, would our whole lives, everything you do, everything we do and say and think as the church gathered and scattered in Kansas City and across the globe be an amen to the slain lamb who is on the throne reigning right now. Would we work in such a way and go to school in such a way and exercise our sexuality in such a way and eat and drink and celebrate and fast and feast in such a way that only makes sense if the lamb is the one ruling from the throne bringing heaven to earth, bringing his kingdom to bear. Friends, every part of your life should be seeking, speaking, sometimes whispering, sometimes shouting, amen to the lamb who is on the throne. And in celebrating communion together, we say amen and bear witness to the lamb who was slain for us who has freed us and forgiven us and made our adoption by the Father and the sealing by the Spirit possible. And we eat and we drink and we would be nourished for a life of amen. So if you have communion elements and you can use whatever you have in your home, if you've got some juice, some crackers, whatever it is, wine, I encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to do that in this moment. To take, eat, drink, be nourished for a life of amen and the Lamb who is slain. Do that now.
Christ community, once again, thank you for joining us for our online service today. We're so grateful that you are with us. If there's anything that we can do as your pastors and your church family to serve you, to care for you, to pray with you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, fill out the online connect card, send us an email, give us a call. We want to remain connected and together even in this time where we're apart and not necessarily together physically uh, in, in groups or on church on Sunday morning. So we're so thankful for you, Christ community. And as you prepare to go to what Jesus has called you to this week, I think there's no more fitting benediction than the one from our text, our passage this morning. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord with these words. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power and might forever and ever. And let us add our everlasting amen to that in our lives, both tomorrow and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week.